have another slice. When you guys... Can you push that back? Okay, so I'm gonna wait for him. Yeah, yeah. There. They're there. Pastor, what's up? How are you? <laughs> How are you? you man. I want to see you. Welcome, welcome. Everybody, Pastor. Pastor, everybody. Are you ready? You ready? Whatever you want. Okay. I mean, I was just saying, like, are you ready? Did you have to change your clothes or anything? No, I can't Okay, cool. So, kind of, I figured we would be doing some things. Appreciate that. You ready? All right, we're just going to right into it. All right. One man's name, Pastor David Hawkins. This name is one that hundreds know around the St. Louis area because this is where his church, Living the Word, is based. His ministry began in this old building in East St. Louis where he started with only two members back in 1998. Today, after more than 20 years, his spiritual center is home to more than 750 people who come to hear him speak at the pulpit. The question again is what are you doing with the time, i.e. life, you have left? You only have a certain amount and it's your most valuable possession. How will you use time? In 1977, Matthew Lee and Hazel Hawkins gave birth to young David in East St. Louis, Missouri. In the early days, David considered himself to be a rebel of the church partially because his dad pastored for 42 years. But little did he know, he would soon follow in his father's footsteps. He wants greatness to abound in you, but we've got to start understanding these wonderful small adjustments that if we make them, we can change the course of the future. Currently, Living the Word is under construction and building a new worship center at a lofty price tag of $3 million. This investment called Vision 2020 is to continue doing the work in creating an atmosphere where people can find healing and create a difference. On this chilly evening, I sat down with Pastor Hawkins at the JW Marriott in downtown Chicago to have a conversation about G-O-D. Pastor, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here, Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy. glad to have you. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation because I think in my entire life, and I grew up in the church, and I, there's only been one other pastor that I have seen personally that has been as effective of a communicator of the gospel as you, and that is T.D. Jakes. What? Yeah. What? Seriously. And I don't say like that to. Like a um, boss. I don't, I don't say that to, to you know to just um, to, to say it. I think that there are very few um, pastors that I've seen, at least, and I grew up in an African church that have mm. been able to really usher the word in such a way that allows healing, restoration, and a sense of identity within the mm. word as a broken being. Mm. And so, I wanted to have a conversation with you because. I think religion is extremely important. So my question, my first question would be is spirituality, right? Yeah. Spirituality mm -hmm. versus Christianity. I think for me, there is no life, no human life mm -hmm. that exists without the spirit. Yeah. But there are a lot of people that are spiritual beings, which is that the same as religion or is that different? So religion would be the system in which any spirituality is housed, right? Religion mm -hmm. or practices, habits, and those things that are called disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I think when a person is overly free spiritual, ultimately they find themselves in some religion. Mm -hmm. It becomes a habit, it becomes a discipline, it becomes a form that allows them to practice, right? Whether that be, I wake up in the mornings and there's a group of us, you know, once it becomes more than me, ultimately it becomes into a religion because then we set times where we meet, set times where we meditate, mm -hmm. set times where we read, or whatever that may be. If it's a vegan diet all of a sudden and we are, you know, using some form or some habit it ultimately turns into a ritual because mm -hmm. that's what the religion part is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of people have wanted to delineate their spirituality from Christianity because mm -hmm. for, for whatever reason, the religion or which, that which it is housed in has been a thing that has caused people to say, well, I, I don't express like that. So you're mm -hmm. calling me wrong or um, I have this mindset. And yeah. So you're calling me wrong. And so I don't think we've done a great job at explaining religion within Christianity, mm -hmm. and so that's why a lot of people have made decisions independent of leadership. So how would you explain religion? 
I would give religion, I think religion is across the board. Again, it's a ritual. Yeah. It's what business people do, it becomes a ritual. It's what a fitness expert does, it becomes a ritual. Mm -hmm. So I think religion is habits, disciplines, repetition. Mm. You know, it's a system that allows me to engage what I consider to be my spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think within the church world, what we have struggled with is giving people on ramps and not being so quick to kick them off if they're not complying with the on ramps. Mm. I agree. Oh, we gonna have some church today. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. So with that, would you say that? And this is I'm, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this. Um, get in by, trouble. By Let's people. get in trouble together. Are Christians the biggest deterrents to Christianity? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, How I so? think it's been the in-house children that has been kicking. Uh, and screaming uh, at closing the doors and shutting the windows mm -hmm. more than the people who have been hurting. It, it is no different than what Jesus went through. Mm -hmm. it, it, he says clearly he came to his own, mm -hmm. which is the Jewish population, and his own received him not. We have this age-old problem. Remember, it wasn't the Roman government that crucified Jesus. It was mm -hmm. the church. Mm -hmm. And so we are having some of these residuals even today. And that's, I believe, part of my purpose, and that's a part of our church's purpose, is to really become the antithesis to a degree of what we see as the standard static religious aspect, where we want people to first engage in rela relationship with each other and with God mm. in a way that doesn't judge them, right? Because mm -hmm. judgment is so easy to issue out. Mm. You know, it hurts people when it's... And, and, mm -hmm. and you can realize, you can do it without realizing you're doing it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so often I have to be self-aware and I think I have, it takes a lot of work to be self-aware. Mm. And, and it takes a lot of self-inspection where you have to really say, am I being a person that is approachable and loving, which is what Christ was, mm -hmm. or am I being a person that's standoffish and judgmental? Mm. Um, so that's why it's in social media where it's easy to get, you know, courageous fingers and just send a few... Uh, one-liners out there to let people know this is where I stand but how many people have you turned off mm. you know how many people in your in your uh, conviction mm -hmm. have you destroyed mm. I love that you said that because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people don't acknowledge that mm -hmm. when you are here when people say I don't go to church because I don't like, like church people yeah. and the rebuttal to that usually that I've heard in some cases has been um, well you can't look at what people do mm -hmm. to define you know, your identity or your belief of what the church is. Yeah. But then I always rebuttal that and say, so if I was to go to an institution mm -hmm. and someone was to say, well, don't look at what these people do as a representation of what this organization is, would that not be false? Because without the people in such an institution, yeah. does that even exist, right? Yeah. And so is it fair to then say the general body of the church is not a representation of what exists within the, the religion or within the uh, institution. Yeah, I think we really get our, sale, our wires crossed when we say that the people are not to be seen as representatives of the very thing we believe in. And yeah. I think that becomes the hard work of change. Yeah. So it's easy for me to dismiss, yeah, you know, yeah, you might you might have a, a letter or a, 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 what we call a varsity letter from high school that mm -hmm. represents your school. Let's just say the name of that school started with an M. So mm -hmm. everyone has an M on that has that varsity uh, sweater. And every time I see those people with those M's on their sweater and mm -hmm. they're beating people up, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to say? So I think the hard work is saying, hold on, let's deal with the people with the letter on. <laughs> mm. And let's do the hard work of saying, change your behavior because this is who you're hurting. Mm. And then now they're able to point to these people are actually exuding love and showing compassion. Compassion mm. is mean I share in your suffering. Yeah. I don't judge your suffering. I yeah. come alongside you and say, how can I help? Mm -hmm. If we did more of that and if we program people to see the good stories, because there are some good stories out there. Like yeah. you had one at our church. Yeah. And we're excited about the legacy we're now five years, six years post college. I'm like seven years. Seven years, man. Seven you're getting years? old. <laughs> yeah, you're getting old. So, th so yeah. that has our relationship yeah. and connection has not ceased because one, I think I've made myself approachable, and then you 100%. can have authentic conversation without judgment. And then I think the last component is, you know, that at the end of the day, that that's a good story to have and a good person to say, I can point to somebody that's trying to figure it out. Yeah. I got a long way to go, Yeah, but I'm trying to figure it out every day. Yeah. So how do you solve the problem, right? If you, yeah. 
How, yeah, how do we solve the problem? I think we over communicate. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in pharmaceutical sales, the legal side, like, you know, I wasn't a drug dealer per se, <laughs> but I did sell drugs. But um, one of the things in the strategies of pharmaceutical sales is you littered the office with information about your drug. So mm -hmm. much so that when the nurses walked down the hallway, they saw some marketing piece of your drug. When the mm -hmm. doctors were thinking that morning, and not that it would influence behavior, mm -hmm. it would remind them of their prescribing behavior. Mm -hmm. So I think the same concept is with the church. We over communicate the realities of what does it look like for us to say, these are the precepts of what we are supposed to be, and we don't let up on it. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we and we embrace the people that are far off. Like, mm. man, when you put Jesus in today's time, he had prostitutes, he mm -hmm. had uh, uh, lawyers, liars, tax tax uh, mm -hmm. abusers all around him, mm -hmm. which should be opposite of the church today. Mm. Yeah, uh, almost this idea that I think most people feel as though I, in order to be a part of the religion, and the yeah. religion being Christian, actually, let me rephrase that, of mm -hmm. a part of Christianity, I have to be perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think we say that a lot. Like, oh, you don't have to be. You're welcome. But I don't think the reality is most people feel that way. No, because there's such a high standard of scripture. It is, yeah. is what it is. I think that should humble us and not cause those um, trends to happen, which says, I'm going to dogmatize scripture, mm -hmm. which is I'm going to make you feel bad about. You're not reaching that standard. None of us reach the standard, which gives us this collective effort to say, let us all climb the mountain of mm -hmm. the standard together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that is where I think the hard work happens, but mm -hmm. also I think that's where um, massive effectiveness happens. Mm -hmm. When we really embrace this idea that not one person is perfect outside of Jesus. Mm. Now, here's where, as a leader in the body of Christ, this is where it gets sticky for me. Mm -hmm. Tell you why. I'm not perfect. Mm -hmm. I'm 1,000% human. Um, I like water. I like Chick-fil-A. Or I like food, right? Yeah. I like sports. I like to sleep. And, you know, occasionally I like to take a vacation. Yeah. But as a leader, I'm not permitted to say I like those things. Mm. Because they that. want me to be yeah. Superman. Yeah. They, they don't, they want me to be Superman. So we're living in this very, uh, what's the word here, juxtapositional desires where mm -hmm. people want access to me, but once they get close up to me, they don't like what they see. Mm. So the balance for me is I have to have what I'll call sweet spot distance. Because if you get too close to me, you might stop seeing Superman and see Clark Kent. Mm. And everybody likes Superman, but they don't like Clark Kent. Mm. I want to get into that. And the reason why I want to get into it is because I had a friend, I have friends, I have friends that are Christian, friends that are pastors, kids, yeah. friends that are pastors, um, friends that are atheists. So I have them all down the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And one of my friends in particular that was a, a pastor, um, we had went out to, we went to a restaurant and I had got a drink because I drink. Mm -hmm. um, I think but, every pastor needs a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Uh, but. <laughs> I didn't realize in that moment as I was getting the drink, the implications that it would have on him. Yeah. You know, of that if someone were to see him, the words that would be. And so in that moment, we had a moment where he opened up and said, you know, as a pastor, you're not allowed to have emotions. You're yeah. depressed. Yeah. Um, and because of the, the, the high standard of Christianity and, and, and unfairly, the expectations that are placed on him. Yeah. Um, how he... It's almost he's very he's very very lonely and we had a moment where I never I never realized that oh yeah but is it and sometimes is it sometimes what's the balance between that right because if, if there is a pastor and, and pastors don't condone certain things publicly mm -hmm. on the pulpit mm -hmm. how does one reconcile okay their flaws as a human being yeah. versus their preachings so you want to go here I want to go there all right so here's the deal one, I think when we deal with the subject of um, uh, adult beverages that some would call wine or drinks uh -huh. or cocktails, I think one of the realities is, is that that is the actual interpretation of holiness standards that we place on church, which is man's way of saying these are the prerequisites for being a Christian and a leader in church. The Bible is clear mm -hmm. of what that is. And if we really let the Bible be the Bible, it says that you're not to be given too much wine. Mm -hmm. Every time in Palestinian history, Jesus sat down to eat, which if you read Luke, 
He eats a lot. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know why Jesus would not be like obese because he eats a lot. Mm-hmm. He eats a whole lot. Every time someone sat down to eat, they had wine. Mm-hmm. Not grape juice. Not Welch's. Mm-hmm. Wine. Mm-hmm. The good stuff. So much so that Jesus' first miracle was wine. And, and, and they said, dude, we mm-hmm. normally let the good stuff be served first and the bad stuff, the watered down wine, be served last. But mm-hmm. you say the best for last. I could only imagine how many tipsy people were at that wedding from that. Mm-hmm. that that's just the reality, right? Mm-hmm. So let's deal with this whole double standard. That's what it comes down to. And mm-hmm. it's an unfair double standard. And do I feel the loneliness of that? Absolutely. I think because of the number of years I've been in ministry, I've been able to balance the insanity of people's expectations. Hmm. When we get to the scripture, we really see a pretty fair job description, although it's lofty. It's not as lofty as people interpret it as being. Hmm. What we fight most of all is not scriptural qualification, it's people qualification. Because if you deem me, yes. Go for it. Go for it. No, that's good. Mm -hmm. Say that again. That we oftentimes fight not scriptural qualification, Mm. but people qualification. Mm. You know, it it, kind of goes back to I heard a great man say something about this. He said, I have to be comfortable that if I reach one person, I've done enough. Mm. That was you. Mm. I did say that. You did say that. (laughs) I've been studying you. Wow. Uh huh. That I have to be comfortable that the fear of rejection does not stop what I'm called to do, right? Because yeah. that's the truth of anything and anyone who's on a stage in front of any crowd is there's going to be that group of people who want to disqualify you. Mm-hmm. We have a natural inclination of humanity of disqualification. Because if I let you do what you're called to do, you're going to call me to a standard that makes me no longer the victim, no longer able to make excuses with my life. So let me eliminate you before you come into your full uh, manifestation. Mm. So back to the double standard is we fight that often. And this is a lonely spot. It is a lonely spot. Um, And um, your friend was right that just the implication of you having a drink would make him almost disqualify from the role of the church, which is sad. It's sad. It's, it's, we make the minor things major and we forget the major thing, which is love and compassion, mm. salvation and redemption, mm-hmm. not disqualification, mm. which is rampant. I've had to learn to live in the dichotomy without living in the hypocrisy of that dichotomy. Mm. So I don't live separate lives, but I live lives separate from the general population of the church. Mm. In order to maintain my humanity and be acceptable, Wow. I have to have a level of distance and separation from the average parishioner. And that's sad because it maintains honor. Again, to be too close up to me sees that I actually love my son. And we play basketball, we wrestle, we play laser tag, we play Fortnite. Mm. I shoot people on Fortnite. Mm. (laughs) We have fun. And oftentimes people want to see you in one dimension as the guy, because preaching is a beautiful thing. Mm. Here's what it does. The scriptures is mysterious in that it's somehow is able to navigate beyond the psyche and get to the soul of man. Mm. And it sometimes feels like you are answering people's longing questions without ever meeting the person. So to us, we are seen as being, my God, you get it. And the truth of the matter is it's not us getting it, it's God giving it to you. Mm. And people esteem us as being almost the one who unlocks the mysteries of their heart. Mm. And they're like, well, I can never see you as human because you know things about me that no one else knew. Let's be friends. And I'm like, no, can't be friends with you. Mm. (laughs) I can be friendly, Mm. but I can't be friends because that space has to be guarded. Mm. So closeness costs me too much. Well, yeah. I have a hard question. Yes. Let's get to the harder. So it's harder than what we've talked about. I think think this one is going to be tough. All right. Um, And, you know, obviously gay marriage is a thing in politics. And so politics and talking about that and. The church has always been a very controversial yeah. topic. Yeah. In 2021, in your opinion, mm-hmm. do you think there is a, a there is a reality where someone who is gay mm-hmm. can be Christian? Can that mutually exist? Absolutely. I mean, I don't think scriptures ever said the two are mutually exclusive. Just like the person who has uh, over much sexual drive for heterosexual relationships can be Christian. <laughs> Just like the person who struggles with he- jealousy or lying or hypocrisy can still be Christian. 
I think we have emphasized such a delineation of separation that if a person has a struggle or if a person has a sin that is more predominant in one person's life than another person's life, that that person's wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, my God, thank God for the last election and it brought out so much hypocrisy mm -hmm. that it let us see there's a lot of people with sins that still call on Christ, but it's not until their sins are exposed that suddenly they're under the spotlight of ridicule. So we've had a great time at judging sins we know, but letting sins we don't know pass. Yeah. And that's all of us. So if the worst struggle, do you believe that someone who is attracted to the same sex is a struggle for the person? So I, I, this is where we get into the weeds. I ascribe to male to female unions. Okay. That's my biblical stance. Yeah. Now, if a person comes to me, which we have people in our church that says, hey, I have a civil union. Can I still worship you? Absolutely. Can I still serve you? Absolutely. But I want you to know, just as any club membership, like Sam's has a mandate on certain things. One of the things Sam's has in order to get into the club, you got to have your card out. <laughs> you you got to have a certain behavior pattern to be a part of that club. I think that it's not wrong with me having that stance, which I feel to be scriptural. The problem when it comes to sexuality and marriage is we have beat people down. Mm -hmm. The only way to convince anyone of anything, whether it be to being generous or whether it means treating your wife right, is to show them the way. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we need to create wars about the subject, but here's what I tell people. We are a Bible-believing church. Mm -hmm. This is the it's prescription I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the prescription scriptures profoundly speak to then how do we deal with those that present with different issues? So, for example, uh, would I have a person who is a known thief to be over the money of the church accounting? Well, well no, but that don't mean they can't be a part of the church. Yeah. It means that I say, hey, let's work with you on that. And again, I'm not comparing thievery to homosexuality, yeah. but I'm using it in the sense of uh, any sin. Um, how many people in the music ministry have had struggles, whether it be same-sex attraction or whether it be heterosexual overdrive, mm. and yet we love them? Mm. I think that, that's got to be the glue, because if, if we keep parsing and, uh, what's the word here, over-segmenting stuff, we lose every time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for answering that. I want to talk about culture. One thing I remember about your church is that you were very particular about not overly indulging in cultural tradition yeah. and trying to keep a separate line between that yeah. and, 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 and Christianity or mm -hmm. religion. And I think a lot of churches will not admit that a lot of, especially within a black church, there's yeah. a lot of culture and tradition. This has nothing to do with the religion yeah. that has been um, perpetuated as um, having to be involved with your faith. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is your response to that? Give me an example. Like what, you, what do you see kind of your experience if you could remind, remind refresh Yeah, me. for example, I, I go to, look, I grew up in an African church and uh -huh. for a long time having your ears pierced as a male was seen as being a sin. That's wow. a big, yeah, it's yeah. very simple. Yeah. Um, and when you, when I look at a lot of American counterparts or mm -hmm. American churches, it's completely normal. Yeah. And I've been trying to convince <laughs> Um, the leaders of my church that that is something that is cultural and yeah. nothing to do with religion and w We will go back and forth and so that brings me to another point of how do you even have a debate with someone? Yeah about religion when once they bring up the Bible and scripture There's no going back and forth like we can't even have a conversation because I will argue with that Yeah, so you know the, so I think every Bible expositor needs to get biblical training mm. I think every preacher needs a level of biblical training beyond the supernatural God calling me in the middle of the night after a White Castle's burger, which is ultimately indigestion, right? <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think that we've got to get to the place where we can intellectually engage in dialogue without mm. making enemies. And I think sometimes people say, they quote the scripture as a hammer, when actually it's a comforter. Like, mm. thy rod and thy staff will comfort me. That rod in scripture is oftentimes New Testament uh, translated into being the word of God. All right, so traditions, culture. I think, um, so I said that to say there has to be two hermeneutics. That is a cultural hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is a word that means interpretation of mm. scripture. So the cultural hermeneutic is something that we have to, as pastors of our generation, we have to decode. Mm. And then there is the biblical hermeneutic, which is timeless. This is what God means, no matter what era it's spoken in. Mm -hmm. 
okay? Like when he says the husband of one wife, that doesn't mean, okay, now it's 2021, I can be the husband of four wives. That one is specific, Yeah. okay? That's a biblical hermeneutic, which means it's timeless. The cultural hermeneutic is what oftentimes we make biblical hermeneutic. Mm. So cultural hermeneutic, for example, in the African-American church would be uh, people love to shout. You know, and they say they catch the Holy Ghost. Well, you can't catch the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know, either you have it or you don't, right? Yeah. You, you come into a relationship with Christ, you have it. But in our mindset, we say, oh, they caught the Holy Ghost this Sunday. Well, mm -hmm. so it means every other time they don't do that. Mm -hmm. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And so that cultural hermeneutic can become law if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. Or if the preacher doesn't do a certain crescendo of the sermon, you know, mm -hmm. you know, we call it hooping. Mm -hmm. um, and the law, I'd say it, mm -hmm. right? That's a part of our culture. Yeah. But all preaching doesn't have to have that same cultural bend. Yeah. You know, in some cases, I think, for example, you being a college student that live in the word church and that we get a lot of college students, is that you all are willing to intellectually engage. Yeah. So my thought process is in that span of time, if I can't challenge you to think, I can't challenge you to change. I can't get to the point where the form becomes entertainment mm. and we miss engagement. Right, right, right. Right. So we do go out of our way. And here's the real balance to that. Uh, I was interviewing a guy here recently for who, 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 for a video position who happens to be Hispanic, uh, originally from Mexico, moved to Texas and landed in Alton, Illinois, of all mm. places. My like, God, God must not like you, man. No, <laughs> no, joking. And so he asked me a question. What's the demographic of the church? Oh, I said, easy, blackity black. And I had this dramatic pause <laughs> and he started chuckling. And I said, now let me explain to you why I said it the way I said it. It has been ages where African-Americans have diminished their cultural uniqueness in worship to accommodate other cultures, whereby we can go into a predominant white church and guess what we're singing on the one and three. Mm -hmm. And we are offbeat with our claps all of a sudden. And we're saying, great church. We diminish who we are to accommodate others. And so then when others come into our environment, we oftentimes are diminishing who we are to make them feel safe. Mm -hmm. So my statement to him was, if God, if God created every human being with a specific uniqueness and that honors him, and he is polychromatic and not monochromatic, then I am sinning when I'm not allowed to be authentically who I am in worship. Mm. So how did I explain that to him? I'm a sweat while I preach. Sometimes that block of time we have for one service will be go over 15 minutes, because as you know, the prayer time can yeah. be 40 minutes it itself. The worship will catch a wave and man, when we start dancing, let them dance. Yeah. Embrace who we are mm. without saying that's wrong or right. So the balance is not allowing the culture hermeneutic to dictate what the biblical hermeneutic is, but yet allowing culture to be expressive. Mm. That's some mastery that mm. requires a lot of intentionality. Oh, that was good. That was good. That was good. That was good. If someone is a good person, because I know we get that all the time, mm. do they have to follow a religion? If we think about life after our human existence, yeah. in order to be a part of heaven, if that's what you call it, or peace after this human life. Okay. So good is a loaded term. It's a loaded term. And the reason I left it vague is because I, I, I leave that vague purposely. Yeah. Purposely. Yeah. So I could find a person right now that could be a good person, mm -hmm. give to charity, uh, don't jaywalk, mm -hmm. pay their taxes on time, pay their bills on time and be the worst parent in the world. Mm. See, when we use the word good, it is loaded because we are not the judge of what good is. Because that person could be good as far as your one dimensional exposure to them. But holistically, they could have child slaves in the basement of their home. We don't really have the full view. Like social media gives us more of a view of a person, except for those who edit their pictures and over filterize <laughs> their pictures, right? But truth be told, even then, you get the insight that this person is not one dimensional. Mm. Like, they just cursed. I celebrate that because I'm like, whoo, because I really thought you had it all together. Yeah. Right. Or they lost it. Yeah. They had a straight manic breakdown. I'm like, whoo, you're human. Welcome mm -hmm. to the club. <laughs> so for me, when I hear the word good, it's so subjective mm -hmm. that I don't think even the definition of good can be fulfilled in their own lifetime. 
How many people have I actually ministered to on their deathbed said, I thought I was a good person. Mm. And at the end of their life, they said, I've messed up. So I think that's a very hairy word, which is why I believe Christianity for me helps to fill that gap because God makes it very clear, no matter how good I am, no matter how perfect I think I am, without him, I can't make it. Mm. Does it have to be Christianity? Uh, for me, I say yes. Okay. And here's why. I've had exposure and experience with other religions, and for me, Christianity works. Mm -hmm. So I was um, born and raised in, my father passed it for 42 years, so I was, I'm a PK, preacher's mm -hmm. kid, and I grew up hating church. Like, man, we was at church eight days a week. Like, we couldn't play baseball. We were so strict because in baseball, you had to steal bases, and the Bible says, thou shalt not steal. Mm -hmm. Like, fact. It was highly restrictive. We couldn't look at TV. We couldn't listen to rap music. Mm. We couldn't listen to anything that wasn't Christian. And so growing up in that environment, I was just like, when I get grown, when I get old enough, I'll never go to church. Mm. In my senior year of high school, I began to experiment with Islam pretty heavily um, underneath my dad's nose. And that was very important for me because I wanted the approval of my dad at all times. Mm. He's my best friend. And still, he is... When people say who, what, what one person in your life made such an indelible mark that you want to be like, it's my dad. Uh, he's my hero, even to this day. Um, and he's been gone since 1998, but he's my hero. It's my, that's my guy. Yeah. Well, I never wanted to disappoint him. So I did practice Islam underneath his nose because I didn't see Christianity as addressing the issues of the inner city and of the African-American. I felt like it was uh, white man's religion. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I begin to see. And I'm like, I can't understand why that we can't do this or that. Mm -hmm. And is I, it not the white man's religion? Um, I would say, it, well, uh, we're actually in a we're doing a big study right now in our church about African, uh, the roots of Christianity in Africa mm -hmm. and how Africa actually uh, shaped Christianity. And so when we say white man's religion, there is a Western Christianity that I despise. Like, I do not agree with American Christianity at all. Hmm. Give, me, give me the Palestinian Christianity, because that's Bible. The stuff today and the stuff we've seen exposed through the election, that's not biblical and that's not Christianity. That's Americanized Christianity. And so uh, some of the great fathers post the apostles, Tertullian, uh, Augustine, were African-American, or African, should I say, they were black. Um, the man who carried Jesus' cross up the hill of Golgotha, Simon of Cyrene, was black. There are so many African uh, uh, persons that influenced the spread of the gospel that they, they, they got ultimately whitewashed. I mean, it's a lot about history that if we get off into those woods, man, I still wrestle with and try to reconcile. Um, from the blowing off the noses of uh, the Sphinx in Egypt, you know, all because it's shaped like an African-American nose, mm. you know, because there is this uh, unfortunate targeting towards our history. Yeah. So I would say to you, no, when we do historical roots, we actually find Africa being very vital. When we go Ethiopia, Ethiopia has been a Christian nation that precedes any westernized Christianity. Mm. And so uh, my Ethiopian brothers, appreciate you. God bless you. So you asked me the question about is Christianity a white man's religion? I think anybody that does the actual re research and studies will find that uh, Africa shaped Christianity. And before it ever came to America, uh, there were countries that were like Ethiopia that were staunch Christian nations. And so that gives me great hope and joy to know that what I am following has no basis in the, in the ugliness of race but in the beauty of humanity. Wow. So, so. Wow. Being someone that I have direct roots in Ghana, both of my yeah. parents are from Ghana. I visited Ghana. Yes. Yeah. How did you enjoy it? Uh, I was at the airport only. Oh, really? Oh, you had layovers? <laughs> yeah, layovers. Beautiful airport. I beautiful say, I airport. Say, I yes. Say. Yeah. But there is something that we talk about as, as Ghanaian children, particularly mm -hmm. those who are first generation who migrated here, yeah. is that there is a clear distinction of the quality of life. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the feeling is though, because our, generally speaking, our parents are a lot more rooted in their faith, yeah. that their lives do not seem as fulfilled in terms of what the world would describe mm. as success. Yeah. Very closed-minded, very traditional. Mm. Um, and as a result, their minds are closed off to a lot of things, again, going back to what's just culture versus 
actual religion. Yeah. And so um, how do you bridge that gap? Or how does one make sense of that to say, well, yeah. do I want that or do I want this? Because... I think a lot of people have the question of, I don't know what's after death. I know what's here. Yeah, right? I totally get what you're saying. So let me, you, 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 you're going to love this answer and you're okay. going to hate the answer at okay. the same time. I'm bracing myself. I'll use my mom and my father who were um, two generations separated from actual slavery. Hmm. And my father emanated from Earl, Arkansas, sharecropper. My mom emanated from Sugarlock, Mississippi. Um, and... Um, we are an interesting tribe. So I am 52% Nigerian. Mm. I am 10% Native American and um, another 20% Congo. Um, so I wanted to know my roots. I wanted to know my history and I got 3% European. So I'm going to be applying for some grants. I need some money. <laughs> no, I think that part of my father and mother's conviction to church and Christianity in particular was, it was safe. And growing up as a person of color in America, it's oppressive. And the only place that you can really express yourself in that era was church. You couldn't be your full self. Jim Crow laws, I wish you would drink out of that fountain, you'll die. Don't go into town after seven o'clock, you'll die. Not, not you'll get hurt, you'll die. Mm -hmm. And the only place for the African-American in that time was the church where you would dress up. You would actually spend all day there. All of those cultural dynamics came because of the oppressiveness that was happening outside of church within the African-American community. I think when you talk about your family uh, having its uh, Ghanaian roots, you're talking about coming into this worldview that you're not accepted as you are. Right. And the only card that gives you some sense of acceptance is that you do believe in Christ. And so that's the place you can be your full self. And we limit exposure, not because we don't want to experience life. But when you go back to your parents roots and I go to back, back to my parents upbringing, they couldn't experience things the way we experience things. There are restaurants they never would walk into because they would never get service. Hmm. I wish somebody would kick me out of a restaurant because of my color. I have a boldness that has been paid for by the fear of my parents. Wow. 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 I just had a moment. Yeah. So that's epiphanal. So when I look at the dichotomy of my father not going to a baseball game, mm -hmm. not being big on vacation, it's because he couldn't. He didn't want to take you know, I'm the youngest of I'm the youngest of twelve, so it's eleven other siblings, and it's all boys and one girl. And at that time, you know, you didn't fly; you drove everywhere. Hmm. And my dad would not want to endanger his children going down the back roads of certain highways for fear that if we get pulled over, we'll die. So they became very insulated and insular very inward focused, very safe. And, and church gave them safety. It gave them the ability to say, if I die, at least I'm right with God. Wow. So I give them grace hmm. because I don't think it's them being intentionally limited. They were literally navigating a car and I probably couldn't handle it. I'd have died in my dash because I'm too loud mouthed and yeah. outspoken. <laughs> I don't know how to behave in the environment. Yeah, what do you mean yeah. I can't have access to the front door? I got to go around the back to get service. What do you mean? You don't mind me singing to you, but I can't drink from the same glasses. I have to have my meal in the janitor's room. That's our history, which America keeps running from, by the way. Mm. Um, I mean, it gets deeper than that, right? Yeah. So I don't think that this generation should be so harsh on the previous generation because they don't know the cards they were dealt. Right. Is that the reason why you think a lot of the younger generation does not subscribe to any faith, right? Because there's a yeah. lot more free spirited, the ability to be able to yeah. live life on your own, own terms, which I think a lot of people try to deny, but I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a reality that what we face is nothing compared to what our parents face. Yeah. 
And so there's no need to describe to anything bigger than yourself because there's a feelingness of bigness within yourself because you can do whatever you have to do. Yeah, I, I think we are, we are on the brink of something disastrous because of our privilege. The, um, the cost that the next generation, your generation including, because I'll put you in the millennial mm -hmm. bracket, I, I, I'm afraid at the cost that's going to, at the bill that's going to be sent to our address in that generation. I'm Gen Xer, and here's why. Freedom doesn't come without a cost. The amount of emotional damage that's going to unfortunately be inflicted because I'm free to do whatever I want to do. The amount of people we're going to leave in the blaze of our experience and our new discovery the amount of moments we're going to miss, even within our own community, because we decided that I'm a free entity, don't need God, don't need restrictions or instruction. I think that report card has yet to be sent to our address. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a passing grade. I have to ask, I have to go more into that because I think it's going to go over people's heads, myself okay. included. Okay. Is the goal not to be free? Right. Um, when we define free, I think you're, you're talking about self-expression. Yeah. Um, so here's the deal. Self-expression never comes without a cost, though. Mm, okay. So Paul put it this way. Let's go to Scripture. Paul says, all things are lawful, but not expedient. All things are open for me to do, but all things ain't wise for me to do. Okay. Like, mm. I can carry a pistol to the airport. Probably not a smart thing to do. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. Um, when we landed in Rwanda, for example, last um, two summers ago, we landed in Rwanda, and Rwanda is highly militarized, you know, because of the assassination of presidents in the past and um, the genocide there. <sighs> we get off the airplane, and man, there's these guys just looking, bowing down, looking. And I'm 6'4", but I felt like I was 5'2". <clears throat> they got these assault rifles, and their hands on the trigger, and it's not on safety. Now, I could use my Americanism, because an American, like, Man, you better not be looking at me like that. What's up? And I'd have been in international news for creating a war hmm. because of my stupidity or because of my expression of freedom. So I, I would say that freedom has to be contextualized. How much freedom is actually causing bondage and how much freedom is self-expression? And then when we say self-expression, are we categorizing that as, uh, are, we, are we comparing that to what we saw our parents and forefathers experience and what did they sacrifice to give us what we have today I think we have to really do a um, full contextualization and not a personal self beneficial contextualization so freedom is a big word mm -hmm. but freedom comes with responsibility I'm free to break this window and jump out of it is that something I want to do? Well, I have a son waiting on me, but I'm free. So I would think my, my concern, if I could give a last speech to your generation and below, the Zillennials, I think the Gen Xs, we were influenced by the baby boomers to a great degree. Mm -hmm. So we tend to be a little bit more compliant. I think we crazy still, mm -hmm. but we got a little <laughs> bit more compliance. Millennials are free, free. Like y'all don't care. Y'all will go to the CEO's office and say, hey, dude, this job is whack. I'm out. And, like, not care. <laughs> I've had a friend that does something similar. You see what I mean? <laughs> we would never think of doing something like that. Hmm. And I think that's the baby boomer's influence on us because they taught us to live for the future, to live for legacy. I think that you all's gift is you live for now wonderfully, but I also think harmfully. Whew. <laughs> Let's take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> what is it all for? If you could sum it up, yeah. if you could sum up the purpose of God, the purpose of faith, um, the intention behind it. Yeah. To where people could grasp it, make sense of it, mm. as you so eloquently put, my generation is dangerously free. Mm. What is the purpose of it? And I'll, I'll follow with this as, you know, this is the Jeremy Coffee Convo. Let's have it. Bring um, it. I, I, said, I said it, I said it on, on, you know, Business to Beats last show just recently. And I talked about just how, um, for the first time, like October, 2019, I got a call on my way to work, found out that my line brother passed away on vacation. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and w what happened to me three months after that was the realization of this idea that I think a lot of times people in my generation or people that are young think that, well, we don't think, I don't think we think it's consciously, just this conscious thought, oh, when I'm old, yeah. when I'm old. And then one day he did happen. And then three months later, I mm. found myself mourning, um, delayed mourning is what they call it. But mm. what it forced me to do is to realize what was Mikey, what was um, Emmanuel, if they knew that was their last day, yeah. what would they do, right? And it forced me to think about life beyond this, yeah. you know? Um, and I had questions. Yeah. I think a lot of people have questions, but I think we shy away from it because it's easy to shy away from it. Mm. It's easy to ignore it, but the reality of it is everybody's going to face that reality one day. Absolutely. Um, so I say that to say, what's the point of it all? So I'll give the big Harry answer first. I do believe that humanity broke ties with the relationship with God as Adam being our federal head. And I think the whole goal of it all is salvation, getting back to the place of worship and, and, and sonship and, 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 and daughtership, that we are sons and daughters of God. And I think that God goes out of his way through Christ and through generations to give us that bridge. I think that is the whole aim of it all. Right underneath that is this word you mentioned several times, and it is purpose. Why on earth am I here? In my experimentation of religion, so I said I studied Islam pretty heavily. That led me from my senior year into my freshman year of college. I started going to the mosque. I was a mosque right outside my dormitory. And um, it didn't do nothing for me. I was angry. Then I tried transcendental meditation. More by, you know, it's this idea of transferring yourself through meditation to spots and lives. And that was just too much work. Mm. Then I tried humanism, which is I am God. God is in me. And so God is in me. I'm going to feed the God in me and I'm going to let the God in me arise. Man, I was depressing. And then I went from there because a lot of my friends were trying this thing that is now um, legalized. We called it gonja back in the day. Um, Mary J was another word for it. They call it marijuana. I didn't want to just smoke. I wanted to know what was behind it. So I started dabbling into Rastafarianism. And uh, that kind of spooked me out. It did. I was like, yeah, I don't think I want that. And I asked God a question, and I was totally against God, by the way. And by the way, I literally was practically atheist. I was a functioning atheist in a Christian home. Um, and I asked God a question. I said, if you're real, would you make yourself known to me? And would you show me what I'm designed for? Now, I don't know where that question came from, because no teaching at the time in my church upbringing ever talked about purpose. That was more of a 90s thing. Um, like late 90s. Uh, and the black church was about survival. It was about the church experience that led to survival throughout Monday through Friday. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was a survivalistic Christianity. Um, and something happened in that question, um, and mo that question and answer moment with God. I wouldn't say he spoke to me, but I will say he spoke to me. It's kind of hard to explain. Sometimes we say speak, we think. David, I am God. It wasn't that, but I felt he answered me. And the only peace I felt in my entire life up until this point was when I started the journey, which took me another year and a half to come to fully accepting Christ. And it was in that I found purpose. And it was in that that no one in the world could ever tell me that what I believe and what I serve is unreal. Mm because God personalized my question and gave me an answer. And part of what I'm doing now is living out that purpose. Because at the end of the day, I want to see people make it in their purpose and in their relationship with God. So when you say, what is the purpose of it all? It is purpose. Because what am I supposed to do while I have life and breath between my birth date and my death date? There's this dash, not door dash either. That's a joke, you're supposed to laugh. <laughs> but that dash is now my purpose realized. What am I doing in my life? 
Because if it's just about me having a balled out time, which we see, we see more people flexing their way into depression than ever before. I, I just believe that the purpose of it all is purpose. Hmm. You have answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you. I wanted to have this conversation um, because I think everybody wants to be validated. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And unfortunately, especially I can speak on behalf of black people, myself included, a lot of us ran away from our Christian roots because of the fact, and I do consider myself to be a Christian, just mm -hmm. to be very clear. Yeah. But we ran away from it because we didn't seek validation in, in our struggles, yep. in our reality, yep. and in our purpose. And the first time I felt that at church was at your church. Wow, man. First time I felt that at church. I, I, I feel like I'm blushing, but I can't blush because then tears will come from my eyes. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Jeremy, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate you. Cool. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to stand up. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. Ooh. This was good, man. It was so good. So you, you brought the zingers to me, huh? Woo! You just go. That was, man, that was some heavy, that was heavy stuff in oh, a good way. In a good way. In a good way. You, 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 you have that gift. <laughs> you have that gift. Oh, uh, um, where's the chicken at?